Good morning, everyone. This is just a notification that we will be starting today's webinar in two minutes. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. And thank you for joining today's webinar, Bring Your Assets Back to Life After Downtime. I'm Bob Miller, Data Analyst with Polaris Laboratories, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. During our panel discussion today, we will be taking live questions from our audience. So remember to submit your questions to our expert panel via the GoToWebinar panel. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive a recording that we will send to your email. We have already included a handout for this topic and you'll see it in your panel. Before we start the presentation, I do wanna remind everyone that all attendees have been muted during this webinar. I would like to take a quick second to introduce myself uh, as a data analyst with Polaris Laboratories. I analyze sample data, provide maintenance recommendations based on those results and assist customers with understanding results, the severities and those recommendations. I've been a part of Polaris Laboratories for more than five years, and my experience includes automotive parts and service, freight aircraft, steel mill, manufacturing, and engines. I am OMA and CLS certified to the STLE. Now enough about me, let's introduce our subject matter experts for today's panel. Our panelists today uh, are Mark Barnes and Julio Acosta. Mark is the Senior Vice President of Global Sales and Business Development at Deskcase Corporation. Mark and his team of lubrication experts help educate end users on the value of precision lubrication and provide support to help asset intensive companies change the way they perform lubrication. Prior to joining Deskcase, Mark was vice president and chief technology officer for Noria Corporation. Our second panelist for today's discussion is Julio Acosta, technical business consultant here at Polaris Laboratories. Julio joined the Polaris team in 2019 and his industry experience includes lubricant sales, distribution and applications in mining, automotive, construction, and fleet maintenance. Julio specializes in helping customers maximize their asset reliability and productivity, all while achieving and maintaining a return on investment. Julio is OMA1 certified by STLE and MLA2 certified by ICML. Thank both of you for being panelists today on discussion. Now let's get started. Uh, first topic of discussion today is In the past, uh, we've restarted hydraulic systems after an extended shutdown period, and we've had problems with valves sticking. What can we do to avoid this? I think, uh, Mark, this may be your expertise. Yeah, th thanks, Barb. Um, yeah, one of the things that we find with, with hydraulic systems is uh, 
you know, the, the fluid over time will degrade, you know, as, as an oil is stressed through heat, uh, and in particular in hydraulic systems, uh, we, do, we see a lot of, of compressive heating. Uh, and of course, when we heat oil, we, we induce oxidation, and that oxidation, of course, starts to degrade the fluid. Um, when, when an oil oxidizes, particularly when a hydraulic fluid oxidizes, uh, the byproducts of that are uh, sticky or resinous in nature. Um, you may have heard the term varnish used to describe that a little bit. Um, and, and what happens is those varnish particles will actually get trapped uh, within small clearances where the oil is, uh, uh, is static. And of course, when the machine is shut down uh, and the oil is not flowing, um, that oil will, will sit stationary. Um, the varnish byproducts are actually uh, uh, temperature dependent in terms of their solubility. Uh, so while the machine is, is running and the oil is warm, uh, those deposits and, and byproducts of oxidation are uh, sometimes dissolved in the oil and don't create as much of a problem. Uh, where the problem lies is when the oil shuts down and cools down, uh, and as that uh, temperature drops, the, uh, the, the soluble byproducts of oxidation start to come out of solution. And when they do that, again, they're very sticky, very resinous. Uh, they get trapped on the inside of, of the spool and the bore of, of a valve, as an example. Um, and, and interestingly, there's actually some, some pretty good studies that have shown uh, that the force that you need to move a hydraulic valve in a fluid that has been aged for a, for a prolonged period of time is significantly higher, two to three times higher than the force that you would need to move that, that valve uh, in, a, in a new fluid that's not been oxidized. So um, yeah, it's not uncommon to see operational issues, uh, slowdowns, uh, slowing cycle times, uh, valves that stick, even valves that fail to actuate uh, when a machine has been shut down for a while. But yeah, I'm interested to hear from Julio, you know, some of the things that we can do on the oil analysis side uh, in order to uh, determine if the oil is, is oxidized and, and whether we're likely to get some of these deposits forming. Yeah, definitely. I was going to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to add to that, that, that any system that has been shut down for a little while, um, even even at rest uh, or with the oil not circulating through the system, as Mark said, the the oil continues to degrade over time. Um, and depending on the amount of oxidation that is present there, you may have some of those situations that uh, that Mark just talked about. So what 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 I would recommend is for the hydraulic system to be restarted uh, let the the oil go through through all the galleys all the nooks and crannies and and um, re-lubricate the whole system making sure that uh, there are no weird noises if you start hearing weird noises then then maybe better to shut it down and and go ahead and do a, a total uh, oil change but uh, if everything sounds great uh, it's best to send in a sample just to find out, you know, the the level of oxidation that you have there. And depending on the level of oxidation that is present, we may suggest a, an external filtration system to try to take some of the particulates out uh, and uh, and clean up the oil somewhat. Uh, Julio, would you recommend anything specific if, if you suspected varnish? Is there some tests that we can run to test for, for varnish in a system or potential for varnish? There are there are some additional tests that we can run. Uh, they're not usually the um, um, part of a, a regular oil analysis, but what we, we can do, there, there's a couple of them. We can do a, a, a millipore filtration where we pass the oil through a through a micro patch and then look at uh, uh, at the particles under the uh, microscope, or if we if we uh, suspect any metallic uh, problems or uh, deposits, then we can do a full ferrographic analysis and 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 look at the type of wear and the type of particles that are present uh, in the system. Yeah, I, I, I would I would add to that. If you suspect that you have a potential for varnish forming, I, I would also recommend that you look at the, uh, the the underlying health of that fluid using a, what is referred to as a membrane patch colorimetry test, which I know you guys can can do at the lab there, Hulo. 
Um, I, I would also probably uh, look for the health of the antioxidant additive. And, and, and as you said, you know, if we think the oil is degraded, it, we may need to go ahead and, and do a complete oil change. But, but oftentimes, uh, we can remit, uh, remediate, I should say, the, uh, the health of that fluid uh, with, some, with some varnish mitigation technology. So, right. Um, and, and, yeah. and, and part of that will be shown, you know, either, either through, well, actually, through both the uh, the acid number present in the um, uh, in the oil and uh, the infrared uh, scan will show the level of oxidation uh, on the oil. Great, uh, that's a lot of good information there, guys. Uh, let's see what our next uh, question here is. So we have some critical gear boxes that can shut the plant down. The operations manager suggestion we do a complete oil change to ensure there are no issues after we start back up. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts? Uh, I'll start with that one. D depending on the size of the gearbox, um, a complete oil change may not necessarily be the uh, the the first line of defense here. Uh, once again, it's best to uh, let the oil circulate for a little bit, take a sample send it out to the lab we can we can look at it uh, we can determine the uh, uh, the level of oxidation of the uh, of the fluid and or the uh, degradation that it takes uh, during as i said before during the shutdown time um, just because the oil is not circulating um, doesn't mean that it doesn't continue to degrade so um, it's always it's always best just to um, uh, pre-plan, um, you know, prior to the full uh, backing operation, uh, do just some some diagnostics um, and and fluid analysis is probably the uh, your first line of defense at this point. Yeah, the, the other thing I would, would add there is, you know, we see this e even under normal circumstances where equipment is running under normal uh, normal uh, operating conditions. You, know, you take a sample, you send it to the lab, uh, the lab runs a series of tests, including perhaps a particle count, and the, the report comes back and it states, you know, hey, the oil, the oil here is, is dirty. And the, 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 first, uh, the first thing that somebody thinks about doing is, is changing the oil. And sure enough, they initiate an oil change, and you know maybe a month later we submit another sample to the lab. The same thing happens. We get a report back says the oil is dirty, and it becomes this vicious cycle. And and the reality is, a, a lot of times, um, uh, you know, when you do an oil change, uh, and you're obviously getting inside the gearbox, you know, if you drain, as an example, 10 gallons of oil out of a gearbox, uh, 10 gallons of air from the plant is going to replace that oil. Um, and if you don't have any kind of uh, uh, filter or vent or breather to prevent that contamination from getting in, uh, as you drain that 10 gallons of oil, you've just dumped 10 gallons of, of, of dirt from the, the operating environment. So uh, while obviously if the oil's degraded, uh, an oil change is, is, is obviously uh, warranted, uh, if you can avoid an oil change, um, it, it's always advisable to do so. Uh, not just because of the cost of the oil, but any time you open up a gearbox or any other asset for that matter, uh, you run the risk of contaminating that asset, contaminating it from the working environment, uh, contaminating it from uh, new oil that perhaps has not been pre-filtered. Um, and so again, any time you can avoid an oil change, uh, uh, it's it's always advisable. Um, the other thing I would add is as as you bring gearboxes back up. Uh, as Hugo mentioned, you can you, you can have some degradation of, of, of the fluid. You can look at degradation of, of the gears and so on. Um, and, and after that gearbox has been shut down for a while, uh, you know, that debris can, can settle out of the system. So it's, it's not a bad idea if you have a, a filtration, a portable filtration system at hand um, to, uh, to plug in that filtration system as the uh, gearbox comes back up to, uh, to, to load and speed. To remove some of those contaminants, uh, so that when you back up and under normal circumstances, um, you know the gearbox can continue to run. So uh, again, if you don't have a permanently mounted filtration system on there, uh, plugging in a, a portable system during startup can, can be a good uh, good help, uh, particularly right. if it's a critical critical asset. Right, Mark. In fact, I was going to mention that too. That uh, if we if we have to run a particle count or if we if we do do a particle count uh, on on that fluid depending on the level of uh, 
of particular matter that is present, uh, we would also suggest the uh, using using a portable uh, filtration system just to uh, take some of that some of that debris out of the of the system. Yeah, and uh, you know maybe Bobby also want to comment on this a little bit as well. But the, the other thing I would say is when you take an oil sample and you test it for a gearbox. Uh, you know, make sure you're running the right tests because uh, a lot of the failure mechanisms we see in gearboxes generate uh, large particles. And in, in, in this context, we're talking, you know, five microns and greater. And, uh, you know, the standard test method that we run in the lab, the ICP method for measuring uh, where particles uh, typically is only going to measure less than three microns. So, uh, but, but you may you may want to comment there about, you know, some things that you do in the lab uh, specifically yeah, I... to ensure that we can pick up those larger particles. Right. Again, just like uh, I, I mentioned before, the uh, the uh, passing the oil through a micro patch and and looking at uh, looking looking at the particles on the microscope will be uh, uh, will be one of the uh, one of those that we can run. Of course, these are additional tests through to the uh, to the regular um, testing package. Uh, the other one again is uh, it's ferrographic analysis. If if there is um, a suspicion of metallic metallic particles also present in the oil, so uh, yeah, with, uh, with we can, ferrographic we can, also, we can go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, we can we can also on on a regular sample uh, we can you know run what's called our particle quantifier, and that's going to be measuring. Uh, on every sample, uh, it, it's it's a, a small test that we run that actually is measuring total uh, wear that's magnetic. So that's going to pick up a lot of the larger larger particles. Um, so if you're seeing a high iron content and and a low PQ result, that may just be rust that we're seeing. Um, but if you're seeing a low iron content and a, and a high PQ, that means we're seeing a lot of large wear, and that would be the time to, to add on one of our one of our analytical tests, where, whether it be a micro patch or a or ferrography. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we got that one. What's our next one here? Oh, filtration. Perfect timing. Uh, does fine filter size cause additives to be filtered out? which may be the antioxidant additives, which are critical to prevent oxidation. And what's the recommendation to prevent the additives from filtering out, but yet retain component durability? Yeah, so that's a very common question that, the, 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 that we get around, around the world of filtration. So the, the answer to whether you can filter out additives is, 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 a, is it depends. And I know that's not, a, not an answer that, you, that people wanna hear, but it, it really does depend on the type of additive and the type of fluid. So the, the question specifically mentions antioxidant additives. Uh, antioxidant additives are chemically dissolved within the fluid, uh, whether that's a turbine oil, whether it's a gear oil, whether it's a hydraulic fluid, or engine oil. So filtering out antioxidant additives um, is, is, is very unlikely. It's almost impossible to filter those out with a mechanical filter. Uh, where you can run, uh, run, uh, run into issues um, is with uh, certain more additized oils and particularly polymeric additives that we use in some fluids. So uh, a couple of additives that we see are pore point depressants sometimes, uh, particularly um, uh, foam inhibitors and viscosity index improvers. So VI improvers and foam inhibitors in particular uh, are polymeric materials that depending on the formulation of the oil could be as large as five to 10 microns. Um, and if the oil is, is at lower temperature, um, some of those additives uh, are kind of on the edge of being uh, in, in suspension of the oil and being dissolved within the oil. Uh, so I have seen circumstances where uh, with certain gear oils, um, certain engine oils, more heavily additized oils uh, at lower temperatures, um, you can remove some of those polymeric additives from, from the oil. Uh, the good news is that if you keep filtration above about six microns, um, the likelihood of that happening is, is fairly low. Um, so with the likelihood of that happening uh, being, being low, you're, obviously you're in, you're in good condition. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it can occur. Um, if you go below six microns, then you can run into to problems. Um, most times, you know, the, the particle count limit that we're setting for gear oil or engine oil is not as low, um, not as fine filtration. 
as we would like to see for a, something like a turbine or a, a hydraulic. So you can get away with filtration, you know, it's just down to six microns. Uh, but again, be, be cautious if uh, if you filter it at low temperature and you can actually always, always test it. There are some tests we can run uh, to determine if uh, if there's a likelihood of additives being removed. Julio, I know you worked for Shell for, for quite some time, so maybe you have some comments from your from your uh, oil supply days. Well, actually, I was I was um, I was just um, uh, going to follow up on on what you were saying. You were you were talking about an absolute six micron. Uh, is it is it is it an absolute um, uh, rating better than the better rating? I mean, what are we talking about here? What what size filters um, would we recommend um, users to uh, to have on their fil on their filter cards? Yeah, I mean the the rating of the filter we would choose obviously depends upon the uh, the, the target cleanliness level that we're getting to. But for you know for for a gearbox that's critical, we want to measure particle counts. Typically, we're going to set limits somewhere in the range of a 17, 15, 12, or an 18, 16, 13. Uh, if you want to achieve that level of uh, of cleanliness, you're probably going to have to use a, a what's referred to as a beta 200 uh, at six micron filter. Um, for those not familiar with beta ratings. Um, essentially, it's the ratio of the number of particles upstream to downstream. So beta 200 means uh, on average uh, 199 particles greater than uh, 6 microns uh, will, will be trapped by the filter. Um, Julio, you mentioned the term absolute. Uh, absolute filters typically will range. Uh, there is a, an engineering method that uh, is used to rate a, an absolute filter, but when you run it through a beta test, Typically, an absolute filter is about a 98, 99% efficient filter. So an absolute uh, 6 micron or beta 200 6 micron uh, will get you where you want to be in terms of cleanliness. Uh, and uh, except under extreme conditions and certain fluids uh, should not impact the additives of the, of the oil. All right, so the next question here, additional to particle testing for debris, how about ISO particle count for other type of contaminations? Other, other type of contamination. Well, um, you know, uh, additionally for uh, uh, testing for debris, um, the ISO particle count um, it's probably our best bet, but it's just uh, that the particle count only only looks at uh, at the concentration of particles uh, based on sizing. Uh, if we want to go look at the actual particles, again, I would uh, I would suggest a ferrographic analysis, uh, looking at both um, metallic and non-metallic uh, particles that are floating in the fluid. Bob, would you add anything to that since you yeah. are in the lab? Yeah. So I mean, we you know we can do it that way. Um, you know, typically, our our ferrographic analysis is we're more concerned uh, looking at wear contamination, uh, but definitely while looking at uh, a micro patch, we can see that there's other types of contamination, uh, and we're typically going to lump that into either wear um, abrasive particles or soft particles, depending on on what we're seeing on the slides. Um, you know, another option I believe we do offer occasionally uh, are photo micrographs. So when you're getting particle count, uh, we'll actually do a small patch and take an image of a patch just to kind of correlate what you're seeing, uh, just to give a physical representation of what you're looking at as well. It, it's not an analysis per se, but it's, it gives you an idea of what you're looking at as far as what those particles might be. Those are just a couple options. Yeah, the, the other thing I would, would add to that is with particle counting, you, you have to be a little bit careful as to how you interpret the data because as, as you obviously correctly pointed out, Bob, you know, soft particles can register uh, as, uh, as, as particles and, you know, they're, they're not truly hard particles in the sense of, you know, dirt or, or, or hard metal debris. Um, so if you, if you get a very high reading in the, in the first micron, the four micron count in particles, uh, that can indicate that you have some soft particulate matter there as well. Uh, the other thing you have to be careful of with particle counting is water. Um, water can show up as a, as a contaminant um, 
in, 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 in a particle count because it actually scatters the particle count. Uh, what I do know is, you know, having been through the, the, the Polaris lab, I, I know that you guys use the uh, ASTMD7647 method, which allows you to actually put soft particles uh, and or water back into solution in the oil so it doesn't impact that. So, um, you know, you want to be careful with looking at particle counts from perhaps other sources. Uh, because if the lab is not using that method, again, you can get some false positives. But Bob, I know you guys use that method in the lab for, for pretty much every sample. Yeah, I, I will let uh, Bob talk uh, a little more about that one. But yes, depending that there are several types of uh, uh, particle count uh, procedures that uh, that can be uh, run at the lab at every every other lab. Um, but uh, and 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 water may be. Uh, an interference to an actual reading uh, of, of real particles. Uh, water bubbles and uh, droplets can be seen as particles. Uh, but yes, we do have a uh, uh, a process whereby the uh, the water is taken out of the solution. And I'll let Bob talk a little more about that uh, in detail. Yeah, so I want to say it's been about two years. We went to uh, a new particle counting uh, machines um, and, and a new new method in that regard that really has helped uh, small amounts of water um, basically be neutralized to, to still give you an inaccurate particle count. Now, I will say even with that, uh, it, it does have its limits. Uh, if you're looking at a, a massive water ingression on a, on a mineral oil, it's still going to, to cause enough problems that it, it will skew those results. Um, and we'll, we'll notify you on those reports of that fact, uh, letting you know that you know, while we may have a result with this amount of water, this, this may be a problem. So um, that uh, it, while it's been mitigated to a degree, massive contamination is still a, still a problem that you want to watch out for. Okay, um, okay, so looks like we've got another question here on particle counting here. Uh, can we use ISO particle count method for non-metallic particles also? And I'll take this one. Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> that's uh, the, the, the unequivocal answer is yes. So particle counting is literally counting anything that basically casts a shadow across that laser. So whether it be uh, metallic, non-metallic, um, it, it's definitely going to um, show those sizes. So the, the particle count isn't necessarily pulling out what's metallic and what's not. It's just showing everything of, of a size range. Uh, to try to determine how much of that's metallic, uh, you would have to combine our particle count with something like PQ, which is a particle quantifier, which is measuring that ferrous material. Um, and then, you know, as well as looking at the standard elemental analysis we've got. Do you guys agree with that one? I, yeah, I, oh. I do. I, so that's, Go sorry, ahead. Peter. Yeah, no, I was going to say I, I do, Bob. Um, the, the one caution I would I would put out there uh, in comparing um, the data from an elemental analysis to uh, particle counts is, of course, the particle count is registering particles greater than four, greater than six, greater than 14. Uh, whereas the elemental analysis, the ICP analysis at least, uh, is, is measuring particles less than three microns. Um, so where I see people, uh, you know, have, having issues, uh, I'll give you an example. I ran into this recently um, where uh, somebody had a really high particle count. They put a filtration system on there. Uh, the iron particle, uh, the iron count, I should say, from ICP was 55 parts per million. After putting the filtration system on there, the particle count went from uh, 21, 19, 16, down to 15, 13, 10, but the iron count only went from 55 to 54 parts per million. And the question from the customer is, hey, you know, what's going on? I want to get rid of the iron. Well, the reality is the iron was caused by water ingression, uh, which of course, when water gets into an iron or steel system, you're going to get rust. And rust particles are extremely small. They're, they're typically sub two micron. So while they're going to show up as iron in the ICP test, um, they're not going to register in the particle count. And of course, if the filter is not uh, is not fine enough, it's not going to remove those those particles. So I uh, absolutely agree with everything you said, Bob. Just be, let's just be cautious as we look at the other tests and understand yeah. the, the pluses and minuses. And and the other caution I was going to mention is that uh, um, while the isoparticle counting is uh, 
it's a it's a very good method to uh, to pick up particles, non-metallic as well as metallic. Uh, it is it is actually an agglo agglomeration of particles. So depending on the size of those particles, you know, I mean, like like rust, for example, you know, it 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 could also agglomerate in 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 real chunks, and and it will be it will be picked up as as larger particles, but um, um, it, it may not necessarily show what the what the actual issue is. So the, so particle counting, uh, along with with the ICP results, the elemental results, uh, is definitely a um, a good basis or a good reference uh, if we want to do some more uh, diagnostics or deeper diagnostics. That's why we have other testing that we can do for, to further that out. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of different tools to offer to help narrow down some of those questions. Okay, so it looks like our next uh, question here is a common problem is water content in hydraulic oil due to absorption of atmospheric humidity. How do we avoid that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one first. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, all oils, hydraulic fluids being no exception, are hydroscopic. So if you leave them uh, in, in a high humidity environment, uh, they would naturally absorb moisture. Um, and this is particularly true uh, where, where, the, where the atmosphere is, is humid. Um, there is a physical law called uh, Henry's law, which basically says that uh, the concentration, uh, the relative humidity of the water um, in, in an air above an oil will be in direct correlation with the relative humidity of the water dissolved in, in the oil. So as an example, if the relative humidity in the, in the ambient area is 80% relative humidity. Uh, if you leave the oil sitting there, the oil will migrate and becomes 80% uh, saturated with moisture. Um, so the way to prevent that is to, um, is to prevent, the, first of all, prevent the water from getting into the system. And the easiest way to do that is to use a desiccant breather. Um, so as, uh, as a system breathes and the air is pulled in from the outside, um, the air would pass through a desiccant breather, which contains silica gel, removes that moisture. Um, but even if the, uh, if the oils become contaminated with water from a different source, um, having a desiccant breather on a tank or a system would be a benefit, again, because of Henry's law, because the silica gel is in contact with the headspace, it will absorb that moisture out of the headspace which in turn will in, in, induce the oil to liberate some of the water. And you can actually bring uh, the relative humidity in a hydraulic fluid down below 20 or 30 percent RH just by the presence of having a desiccant breather either on the tank or on the, on the reservoir. Julio? Well, I have nothing to add to that one, particularly to be honest with you, because it all has to do with desiccant breathers. That's what we suggest as well. It, it, it does, but on the oil analysis side, I, I would say also let's let's be cautious about how we measure the water content, right? So uh, there are a lot of different tests that we can use to measure water in in hydraulic fluids, and we want to make sure that we're using uh, the correct method. So uh, the Carl Fisher method, uh, particularly using a co-distillation uh, apparatus, which eliminates in hydraulic fluid uh, the ZDDP additives, uh, sometimes can show a false positive of water. Um, so we want to make sure that we're using uh, the Carl Fisher method, including the co-distillation option, uh, which will allow you to get a very accurate uh, idea of, of how much moisture you actually have in that fluid. T totally agree with that one. And, 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 and the word of caution that I want to pass on is that uh, uh, those tests are not part of a, a regular test package. But, uh, but yes, they can be done and they're more precise than than just the regular ones. Yep. All right. Okay. So we've got one one coming up here. Um, on the water, since we're on uh, water and hydraulics, uh, how do we prevent microbial contamination in stagnated hydraulic oil during extended shutdowns? Well, you want to take that? Well, that's uh, that's a uh how do we prevent it i mean other than then um 
the microbial contamination comes in uh, because of because of water. So what we were talking about before, um, you know, getting some of that moisture out of the system will will help with that. Uh, I don't necessarily um, suggest using any um, any additive that can help with that uh, with that contamination, but uh, but to be quite sure as to the the amount of contamination once again is uh, it's sending a sample to the lab and we can run testing and uh, and determine if 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 it's uh, at a level that uh, that will be detrimental to your system or if uh, perhaps uh, um, what is called sweetening the oil um, taking some some of the oil out and and bringing some fresh oil in may reduce some of this contamination yeah i mean you know you obviously you're you're, you're correct uh, microbes uh, grow in any uh, petroleum fluid it's more common to see this in fuel uh, particularly biodiesel um, but the the bugs live in the water phase and, and they they eat the petroleum that's kind of their food source um, so you know the question is how do you prevent it or well, pr prevent it is to is to keep uh, the the water out the bugs can't can't live without water being there so the same comments we made before uh, around desk and breathers is, is is one comment the other thing is keeping keeping the oil a little bit warm so putting a circulating uh, lube oil filtration system external filtration system uh, is is a good idea as well if it's a large hydraulic tank or a bulk storage tank again whether that's hydraulic fluid or fuel um, if, if the question is more in line of, uh, of of what do you do if you have it already uh, obviously, as you have said, there's tests that the lab can run to tell you if you have a microbial issue. Um, there are biocides that you can use. They're more commonly used in fuels, um, uh, biocides which, which will control it. Um, but even with the use of those biocides, it's, uh, it, it's a pain. Once you have microbial contamination and, and the, the sludge and the deposits that go with it, uh, it's, it's a bear to get it out. Uh, so. You know, again, the question is prevent, and, and that's that's absolutely what you should do, prevent it from occurring by keeping that fluid uh, warm, uh, keeping it dry, and, and keeping it moving. Uh, and in, in that way, the, the bugs won't tend to grow as much as, as if the oil is just sitting there and cold. Yeah, so I, so from from what I understand, you, you are also um, not necessarily totally against it, but uh, you, like, like me, I, I I would not necessarily suggest any uh, to use any biocide uh, uh, in the system. If you can avoid it, yeah, absolutely. All right, okay. So what do we got next here? Uh, MPC tests have been widely used as parameter to determine varnish. How about pentane, hexane, toluene insolubles? Well, I I, I don't think. Uh, um, uh, Bob, you were intended to be in this um, uh, as, as part of a a uh, expert panel, but uh, I think you can take this one. Uh, this is not one I'm all that familiar with. I know that uh, we've got experts on staff for that that I always turn to. Yeah. So yeah, I can I I can give give a little bit of an answer on that one. So you know the the MPC test um, uh, for those who are not familiar, MP, MPC is just really a way of measuring um uh, chromophoric changes within the oil so chromophoric changes occur uh whenever the oil um the the hydrocarbons um change uh, structurally change um and you can kind of liken it to darkening of the oil right so as an oil degrades the oil becomes darker um and those those uh, deposits uh check create a color change and we use the mpc test uh to indicate the degree to which the oil is degraded uh, and while it's a really good test to tell you about the potential for sludge and varnish to form, um, it doesn't tell you the mechanism by which that sludge and varnish and dark deposits have formed. So um, when you look at the possible ways that an oil degrades, there's oxidation, there's thermal failure, there's a number of different ways that that oil can degrade. Um, and the chemical byproducts from something like a thermal failure, uh, which are very, um, carbonaceous in nature they're very dark almost black in, in color uh, are very different to the kind of brownish rusty colored particle or, or deposits i should say um, that we get from oxidation well it turns out that if you use different solvents like pentane and hexane and toluene um, the different chemical constituents that are byproducts of oil degrading 
uh, are more or less soluble in those different solvents. So we can look at the degree to which uh, any material, uh, any suspended material is soluble in, in pentane versus hexane, uh, hexane versus toluene, and it can tell you something about the degradation pathway. So it's, it's a fairly um, uh, sophisticated uh, process that we would use where we're truly trying to diagnose the underlying root cause of a chemical change uh, in, in the base oil. But um, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a less commonly used test. The MPC is kind of a widely used, hey, do I have a problem kind of test. Uh, but if you really want to dig one layer deeper, using some of these insolubles testing is, uh, is, is a really, really good strategy. Right. I was going to, I was going to add that, uh, yes, there are, there are specific testing for picking up pentane, hexane and toluene insolubles, uh, but they're not commonly used just like, um, uh, Mark was saying, uh, but we do have that capability. Uh, laboratories will have that capability. Not all of them, but uh, some will have that capability. Uh, but they're not uh, normally used. In fact, uh, I haven't seen one in a in a while being uh, being tested for those. They're they're particular for oils that have to be really really clean, like turbine oils. Um, so you know the 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 they're not used commonly. Yeah, I know that uh, the fluid really being dark, it can definitely impact the, the patches on those. So we want to make sure that we're not recommending that for something like a gear oil. Obviously, it's not going to have a have an application there. Okay, what's, uh, what's our next question here? We've got power plant operations typically will face varnish issues. And one way to remove it without shutting down the operations is via varnish removal filtration. Does this external filtration system pull out the anti-foam? Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so the, the, the answer to that is is typically no. Um, you know, they, they talk about power plant, so I'm gonna make an assumption here. When you say power plant, uh, the assumption is this is, we're talking about a turbine application, whether it's a steam turbine, a gas turbine, combined, combined cycle. So, you know, if you talk about a gear oil or an engine oil, um, a common anti-foam additive we use there is methyl silicone. And, and uh, you know, it, previous question, we talked about how that polymeric additive can be stripped using filtration. Um, in, in low viscosity fluids like turbine oils, like hydraulic fluids, uh, the most commonly used anti-foam additive is going to be a polymethacrylate. And polymethacrylates are truly dissolved within the oil. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about a gear oil, yes, caution needs to be there uh, for removing uh, anti-foam. Uh, but for uh, for turbine oils, if that's the question here, for turbine oil, um, I would not be concerned uh, with any filtration, whether it's a varnish removal system or, or otherwise uh, pu pulling pulling out uh, pulling out the the anti foam. Uh, I I could envision some weird chemistry that would do it, uh, but under normal circumstances, I don't think that you would have any any real concerns there. Yeah, I I was gonna I was gonna add that. Uh, uh the blending of uh, finished lubricants have advanced so much that uh, stripping some of these uh, elements out uh, or components out, it's, uh, it's fairly low uh, risk. There's always a risk, uh, and, I, and I would think that also will depend on, on the type of filter that is being used. Um, too tight of a filter will probably strip some of it out, but it will not. It will not strip everything out. Uh, so let's, you know, there's always there's always caution, just like you were saying, Mark. Yeah, uh, Huli and I were just reminiscing uh, just yesterday as we kind of prepped for this session that we've known each other, you know, nearly 20 years, and and I think in the 20 some odd years that I've been I've been in this business, um, it, it's it's probably a dozen or less situations where I've seen filtration stripping additives. Um, but but it does happen. Uh, but specific to this question, um, I, I I have never personally seen it with a with a standard uh, you know turbine type oil in a power plant application, uh, even even with a with a very fine filter. I agree. Good. Okay, so what do we have next here? Um, particle count for dark color oil with the laser work. Um, that answer is maybe. 
depending on how dark the fluid is. Uh, we don't do particle counting for our diesel engine oils just because they are black uh, and that does become a, a difficult problem. Uh, but we do have methods for diluting down some of the darker oils to still get um, get counts uh, for particle counting. Uh, you just want to make sure that you're using particle counting for an appropriate component type. Um, not necessarily a good option for your diesel engine, um, but it's it's probably going to be a lot better option for your your hydraulic fluids. Uh, Julio, what do you think? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, um, <laughs> I I don't want to date myself back here, but um, um, dark color uh, fluids like engine oils, uh, particle counting was a no-no way back when. Um, it, it it really will not. You know, will the laser part, will the laser particle counter work? As as the question is, yeah, it will work, but it will show you a large amount of particles because the agglomeration of oxidation, um, degradation particles, um, uh, even metallic particles will be so large. Um, you know, you will actually get a real, real high particle count. Yeah, Mark, I think we've most Go ahead, Mark. No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we've we've used uh, we've used particle counting even on on diesel engine oils, and I absolutely agree with with the previous comments. It's not standard to do that on diesel engine oils, and you don't need to do it on every diesel engine oil. Uh, but if you're trying to, for example, uh, uh, if, if you're adding, for example, supplemental bypass filtration, and you want to validate that that filter is is doing the the job, as you mentioned, Bob, you know, labs can uh, can do a dilution. It's typically a ten to one dilution. Uh, and there are ways that we can get around the color of, of the fluid. So, um, you know, typically our darker fluids like our gear oils or our engine oils, um, we're not as interested in, 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 the, in the particle count anyway. Um, but if you are trying to monitor it, you know, the dilution methods that, that Bob and Julio mentioned are, are a good way to do that. And I, I know uh, having been through the lab there, Bob, you, you guys can do that. Uh, even, on, even on engine oils, I've, you know, I've had some, some good data from, from your lab. Uh, specifically on on engine oil particle counts in support of a filtration project that we were working on. Yeah, and, and you just want to keep in mind if you're not filtering the fluid, particle count may not be the best option, and that's where we would probably recommend something more like uh, particle quantifier, where we measure your metallic content rather than just sheer volume of of particles, because it may may not be beneficial to what you're trying to to figure out. Absolutely. Okay, so what do we have next? Uh, let's see, next question here. What is the mobile particle counter accuracy compared to lab particle counter equipment? Um, oh, well, that's a, that's a pretty good question. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> of course, I'll be a little biased uh, in, in what I'm going to say, but um, um, the, 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 the test in the lab will be much more precise than than a mobile particle counter. The mobile particle counter uh, will just give you a, a an idea of particles that you have present, but it but it's uh, uh, I don't think that it will it will actually break it down into into size particle size ranges. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but. Uh, because I haven't seen a, a particle counter, uh, a mobile one uh, recently, but, uh, but as far as I understood, uh, when they first came out, it was just going to give you a global number. Uh, and then there was a, a, um, a table that will convert uh, to an approximate number of uh, or concentration of particles present. Yeah, so um, th there are particle counters, uh, mobile particle counters on the market today that will give you, uh, it will report in the, uh, you know, standard four, six and 14 micron ranges that we that we report from a lab sample. Um, but I, I agree with you, Julio, in, in, in what you said, you have to be really careful because in a, in a lab instrument, um, the lab instrument uses the a method uh, of light scatter. Uh, whereas a mobile particle, most of the mobile particle counts on the market today use light blockage. Um, and when, when you use light blockage, uh, if you have a very, very uh, clean sample, 
there is no light blocked. So essentially the sensor is seeing almost 100% of the light and that's a very high background. So if you have a very small particle flowing through that sensor, the shadow is very, very small. You're starting to see a small change on a very high background. Um, so what you actually find is if you compare uh, the ISO um, 4406 particle counts from a lab sample to a mobile particle counter uh, in the what I'm going to call the mid-range regions of particle counting, 19, 17, 14, uh, you'll see a reasonably good correlation uh, between the two methods, lab and, and, port and portable. Um, you get readings when fluid is fairly clean, you can get readings down around uh, 963. Well, I've never ever seen a 963 particle count out of a lab and it doesn't mean the lab is not doing the test properly. It just means that the methodology is different. Uh, so I absolutely agree with your, your point there, Julio. Uh, there is a role for mobile particle counters in the field, but it is a trending tool. Um, it tells you whether the oil is getting cleaner or dirtier, uh, but I would caution anybody that you, is using a, a mobile particle counter in the field, um, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking about sensors now in particular, be, be cautious. Um, you can get uh, handheld uh, laser scatter particle counters that you can take out of the field uh, and plug into an instrument. They do give you an accurate reading, but I'm assuming the, sensor, sen the, the, the question here rather is about a particle count sensor uh, as opposed to a true laser particle counter that we're, we're taking out in, into the field. But they have their place, um, but uh, I, I don't think anybody on this panel is suggesting that they replace you know, high quality lab analysis. Definitely not. As far as accuracy, you know, the uh, the the laboratory method is it's more precise than uh, than any um, mobile particle counter. Right, and one of the things to keep in mind is uh, sampling procedures can have a really large impact on particle counting, especially um, you know if if you're pulling. Uh, say out of a sump um, and you, you just pull it straight out of a drain that can cause higher particle counts than you may be expecting because they've settled out so you know make sure you're following those proper procedures for pulling those samples when you send them in uh, as well to make sure that it, it's accurate to follow along with that yeah that is actually one of the benefits of having a, a portable particle counter if you set it up properly put the sample port in the right place as, as you said bob um, and if, if you probe onto that sample port in the right location, you eliminate the potential of getting um, uh, of getting uh, erroneous particles in the sample, either through you know uh, poor bottle cleanliness or poor handling of the sample, or uh, you know some, something in transit. Uh, so there are benefits again to having uh, part portable particle counters in the field, uh, but but again, I don't think anybody would suggest that it displaces the lab. No, in fact, uh, it just occurred to me that um, uh, you know the the mole particle counter could actually be used in conjunction with the um, uh, with the portable filter cart. In that, uh, uh, if you see that your trend is is increasing, your particle particular trend is is increasing, you can use the uh, the uh, portable filter to try to get some of that uh, dirt out of there. Exactly, it's a trending tool. It's not a replacement for lab uh, for lab analysis. Okay, well, it looks like we've got one more question. We've got time for one more question here. Um, so, in your experience, guys, which type of assets are more prone to shut down, cause problems, dry or wet sumps? Well, what any anything that oh, sorry, anything yeah, that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Anything that uh, that where where water can get into the system will definitely um, uh, be more prone to causing um, uh, shutdown problems or failures, for that matter. Um, anything anything that is exposed to water uh, will oxidize much faster. Uh, water can also be floating freely which uh, which will actually cause some rust and corrosion in the system um, so I, I, in my mind wet sumps is a, it's a more uh, prone uh, or problematic um, situation here 
Yeah, I, I I would agree with you in general. I mean, there there you can always think of scenarios where where a dry sump would be a, would be a challenge. But with a dry sump system, um, you know, you always have an opportunity to apply some degree of filtration on the oil in the in the reservoir before you start it back up. Uh, if you follow proper startup procedures of of getting the oil flowing at the right rate before you uh, you know start up the machine and uh, and apply loads to the machine. Um, then, then you can mitigate a lot of that. But, but as Hudo correctly said, you know, as if you've got a wet sump si si uh, system like a pump or like a splash lubricated gearbox, uh, if that oil is is static and cool, um, when that oil cools, uh, all the suspended uh, material, whether it's uh, oxidized oil, whether it's uh, water that was dissolved, is now come out of solution, and that's when you start to see uh, etching and corrosion. Uh, on systems, and once you start to get that etching, uh, you change the surface profile of your of your bearings or your gears, uh, and the next time those bearings or gears engage, that surface profile uh, is 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 not adequate for proper lubrication. So I, again, you can think of scenarios where both cases are, are problematic, but I, I totally agree. Wet sumps generally are more problematic and and need to be carefully thought about before you bring them back up to life. Great. Okay. Well, I think that was our last question. Um, before we uh, turn it over to you guys for a final thought, just want to thank all of our uh, audience for all the questions. Uh, those that we did not get to in our presentation, uh, we will be reaching out to you via email. Uh, either myself, Mark, or Julio uh, will reach out to help you answer those questions. So, final topic here is what uh, what kind of final thoughts or advice would you give our advice? Ad, uh, our, give our audience. Mark, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, for, first look at look at critical assets. Uh, think about the uh, the potential failure mechanisms that can occur in critical assets. Uh, so if you're an injection molding plant, as an example, think about the health of the fluid uh, and make sure that you, you know that that fluid is healthy before you start. Um, you know, contamination is uh, is 80 to 90 percent of, of all mechanical issues in, in lubricated systems. So think about whether the oil is clean, whether it's dry, uh, whether the oil is still healthy for continued use, and and use shut down as an opportunity. You know, none of us like to to be to be sitting here and, and with with less to do than we had maybe uh, three months ago. But uh, you know, Winston Churchill said, you know, in every crisis there's an opportunity, and let's use the shutdown as an opportunity to think about the health and the cleanliness of the fluid the things we can do to bring that machine back to life uh, and, and work as reliably, if not more reliably, than before we were shut down. Right, and, I, and I, the, the only thing I will add to that is, um, you know, use any of the, of the tools available to you. And um, fluid analysis is one of those, uh, vibration analysis and so many other uh, preventive uh, uh, tools that you can use uh, right before you uh, you turn on turn the system back on and uh, then you'll have to shut it down because you didn't have all of the uh, precautionary measures uh, ahead of time so just take you know just just plan uh, ahead of time and uh, use any available tools that you have Great, guys. Uh, well, I'd like to thank both of you guys uh, for sharing your insights to uh, safely bringing back equipment and how fluid analysis will play an important role in that. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, uh, myself, Mark, and Julio, we can be reached uh, via email or LinkedIn, as you see there on your screen, and we'll make every effort possible to respond back to your questions as quickly as we can. As moderator, I will be sending you an email in the next couple of days with additional information on both our future webinars and additional upcoming training opportunities. Our next webinar will be on June 16th, and our presenter will be Oliver Ferguson, Marine Program Manager with Polaris Laboratories. He will be discussing how fluid analysis can make an impact for the marine industry, lessons learned from the field, and best practices for sampling. We have sent you a registration link in the chat, so if you'd like to register for the next webinar. With that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar and have a great rest of your day.